I know that you're not real excited about oh. talking about this stuff. So just talk to me a little bit about um, how you feel about opening up about some, some of your experiences. I'm not a fan of it. I mean, a little nervous, a little guarded, a little uptight. Um, I ran out of my special medicine. Uh, VA is not great on that one, so that's not helping. But I think um, what did help is helping a little bit is um, I went through an intensive uh, two week inpatient course uh, that the VA actually paid for um, through Emory University and it helped me open up about all this kind of stuff. It was immersion therapy and that's exactly what they did. They immersed me in um, all my traumas. So I, for the first time I was actually able to talk through them over and over and over again. So I, th I think that's going to help a little bit. So, so basically, if you think about it, this is exposure therapy. You go over the trauma, you just keep going over it and going over it and going over it. He would have me just start from beginning to end more details of like uh, the, the fire one. Um, like he would be like, all right, stop. What are you feeling right now? Close your eyes. What are you feeling right now? I'm feeling the heat on my face. I'm feeling this. I'm feeling that. Um, so that course taught me that that's how you get through the trauma. You don't bottle it in. I think you know that. That's why you said that analogy. Um, you have to talk about it a little bit. So first off, good morning, everybody. Uh, so everybody doesn't know everybody else. Earl, he's basically the boss. He uh, runs the front, he's out here helping out. Mark, this is Mark Shaw, for those who don't know him. This is uh, David, I'm sorry, I don't know your last name. Hello. Uh, so basically, once uh, eight o'clock, I need you guys parking. Um, and then uh, if it doesn't look like it's too much, I can one of y'all can shift over here. Uh, I'm supposed to have a couple more volunteers, so hopefully they show up. Uh, but please take care of yourselves. If you need a break, take a break. Other than that, we, we go hot at not eight, and then real hot at nine, and we're going until one o'clock. Um, I'm from Rochester, New York. Um, upstate New York, it's just uh, south of Buffalo. Um, way different than Texas, very cold. Uh, born and raised there. Um, my mother, Joanne, my father, Sam, were uh, Sicilian. Um, only second generation uh, American because uh, my mother's father came from Italy. He uh, served in World War II. Um, he was infantry and then he was military police. So that was always my, uh, my, um, my main motivation to do that. My father, um, his father served in World War II. I don't know much about his father, uh, but, and, he, my, and my father was uh, Air Force. He served in Vietnam. So for me, that was, um, that was the motivation. My father always told me and my brothers, because uh, I had two older brothers and one baby sister, always told us that, you know, um, there's no draft anymore. Uh, and he wants us to, you know, live our lives and be what we want to be. But he would like one of us or all of us to serve their country like he did and my grandfather did, etc. cetera. Um, and I was, the, uh, I was the only one who decided to serve. I joined the army um, in 1997, peace time. Uh, a lot of people you talk to nowadays, they didn't join during peace time. Even a couple of people at my office, they joined after 9-11. Um, so I'd actually had four years of peace. I left the army at 21 years. I retired at 21 years. That's four years of, uh, of peace and 17 of not peace. We're looking at a uh, live picture from Washington, and there is smoke pouring out of the Pentagon. This is coming at 9.43 Eastern Time. In a brief remark, the president, he said this was an apparent terrorist attack on our country. I was on the SWAT, um, Special Reaction Team, SRT. 
uh, we were supposed to, and that's just a part-time gig. So basically we would get together once a month for a week or a couple days, we'd go train. So we were just setting up, the range was just for us. I think we maybe had 14, 15 people. Um, we were just setting up and somebody had the radio on and they were saying what was what was going on on the radio that, you know, uh, a plane, I forget which one, I think it was the, I think it was the towers. And we're like, so we decided, hey, let's stop putting together. Let's, you know, all his team leaders came over with our, with the platoon sergeant and we're just trying to figure out what's going on and we can't get a hold of anybody back at our unit. We're calling, calling, calling. Finally, we get through. They're like, get back now. One, three, Third aircraft hijack heading towards Washington. Uh, our orders were to meet up with DC police commander and we were going to assist him with, uh, well, assist his unit with evacuating DC. Because again, we're not hearing much. We're hearing that we're under attack and we're at war basically. We're walking up to literally talk to the this DC commander, and somebody runs out. Hey, hey, hey! Get get over here and you gotta get on the phone. So Staff Sergeant Teal goes there, gets on the phone, and basically he explains to us that they're like, "Where the hell are you? You told us to be in Washington D.C. Well, we don't need you there anymore. You need to go and secure the Pentagon." Wait, what? <laughs> Again, we. 14, 15, maybe a 17 man team. How are we going to secure the Pentagon? <laughs> so DC, now we need to get from, now we need to get from Fort McNair to the Pentagon. Everybody's trying to get away from there and we're trying to, we're going towards it. So we almost get to the Pentagon. I mean, we can see it and wow. I can tell you within the next few days, the common feel was everything has changed. Nothing is going to be the same anymore. So after 9-11, I had orders to, for dog school, which then sent me to Germany. Then I PCS from Germany to Fort Carson, Colorado, as part of the 3rd Brigade 4th Infantry Division. Um, now, after once I got there, they already had orders for Iraq. So this is February of 2005. They already had orders. They knew they were going to Iraq in November of that year. I was helping out with what's called the, the BDIF Brigade Determent Facility, which is a small jail. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Abu Ghraib. This facility is where you go to before you go to Abu Ghraib. The Abu Ghraib situation where the MPs and military intelligence got in trouble for the uh, harassment and the torture and all that stuff. So everything changed nice and legal. So my job was whenever they rolled up detainees and brought them to the facility, everything was nice and legal. So we had to build packets on them and that was my job. I built packets on them, photographs, iris scans, backgrounds, everything else. Everything that they found on them when they found them or any kind of family history or whatever they had. That's what I was doing and then I was also, I had two jobs. I also was part-time, um, I went with the uh, Air Force EOD bomb squad. So I would be working in the day and then I would get the call, uh, put down my stuff and I'd go with them and we would go outside the wire. You know, we secured the area, they sent the robot, okay, blow it in place or grab it or whatever. Then eventually we're like, all right, we could go finish our mission, which was go pick up all the stuff they've been, they've been uh, finding and go do a, what's a controlled debt, which I, Pretty sure I have a video of something to find. Not much that tour, I mean, a couple IED hits. You know, I did get my cab, my combat action badge, because, you know, I got, we got mortared. I was very close to a bunch of mortars, a bunch of rocket attacks. Um, drove through, my vehicle itself got hit by an IED a couple times. Uh, small arms fire a few times. Um, RPG tried to hit a helicopter I was on one time, but so that was the first tour. I came back in November of 06 uh, from that. From that. Uh, and and um, funny, I think it was the summer of 06, while we were still in Iraq, we found out we just came down on orders to come back to Iraq the following year. <laughs> like, we, can, we, can, we, can we even finish this tour? So um, sometime that year, we found out that this tour was going to be a 15 month or this. They just started playing around with this idea of a 15 month tour. 
So we left for Iraq in 07, uh, November of 07, which means two Christmases. So this was like my 9-11-2. So what happened was um, during March, April of 08, um, the leader of Cyrus City, a guy named Jamadi al Sadr, I believe his name was, he's basically a cleric, but he has his own army. They decided to basically do an uprising. So U.S. forces weren't allowed inside Cyrus City, but Iraqi forces were, they had checkpoints. So they decide to do a calculated attack and they attack all of the checkpoints and they basically kick all of Iraqi forces out of Cyrus City. I was at Fob Hope. From Fob Hope, you can look into Sadr City. So we were getting hit left and right. Well, when I was at Fob Hope, we were living in old Iraqi office buildings. Well, during these many different uh, mortar attacks, rocket attacks, one hit the roof directly above my room. So I was actually in my bed at the time and it hit right above me. Uh, but I'm fine. The only thing that happened to me was my room was blanketed in dust and it just sent a, like a shake through the building and I guess this cloud of smoke out my room. They thought I actually got hit and I just walked out dusty as hell. No, I'm good. <laughs> but yeah, Sutter City Uprising um, uh, was just a lot of violence because they were attacking everybody. Um, Iraqi forces completely left. Um, but within the next few days, uh, a lot of casualties because they were, you know, just attacking everywhere um, near Sadr City. And eventually during my tour, they decided to take these big giant cement jersey barriers, these things giant, and wall off all of Sadr City. Matter of fact, it's mentioned in that American Sniper movie. We went on a mission kind of driving through this area. It was the first time we took these big trucks that we had down these areas, uh, MRAP. I remember exactly where we had to go out, but we had to go pretty far out, I think to the green zone. We had to go near there and we had to come back. So um, we had to get behind uh, route clearance, which is EOD, they're clearing the route. So we got behind them and it was a huge convoy. I wanna say like 20 vehicles. So very long and we were going like five miles an hour. It was a, I want to say it was a 14 hour convoy. I kept account of everything that happened. But the whole convoy drove something through like nine IEDs. We had two small arms fire attacks, one RPG attack, one rocket attack, one KIA. We're driving down and we kind of entered this village and um, two vehicles ahead of me is a tanker, a fuel tanker, blows up. Nobody knew where it came from, but it was an RPG. I don't see it, and I'm the freaking gunner. My captain doesn't see it, my driver doesn't see it, nobody else in the convoy, we know that at the time, sees anything. Blew up this thing. So at first it was just like, okay, it was, it was a little bit on fire, a little bit on fire. Before you know it, the whole thing is just encased in fire. Now we're a 20 vehicle convoy. So we're basically split up at this point. Half is over here. Uh, in front of the fire is a giant wall of fire. So the commander of the convoy decided that we need to get all the vehicles through the fire. Remember, I'm a gunner, so I'm completely exposed. So the first vehicle drives through is fine, uh, but now it's our turn, we're the second vehicle. And my driver, my commander were telling me the same thing, pop down. Now you can pop down, drop the hatch, pop down for safety, they told me to. I decided to stay up there because I just had this crazy feeling the second we drove through the fire, bam, small arms fire. Uh, and I was on the gun and I was, you know, I wanted to defend my guys. So I stayed up there. Our driver, Specialist Nelson, goes driving by very slowly. And I just remember in it. And every time I think of it, I just, I, I feel the warmth of the fire. I mean, I was just driving in a wall of fire all around me fire for some reason i didn't burn up i was completely fine the only thing that happened was you know in a fire that's burning something like a bonfire those little floaty things you know a little piece of material you know float 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 floats right down here uh and i was like ah they're like oh my god you're on fire no something down my back tosses me up a a, a water bottle so very slowly we come around the corner and now we're back in a straightaway now all of a sudden, 
I hear it and I see it. Small arms fire. We start getting hit. Um, but it's all the way to the front of the convoy. I mean, it's far ahead. I can see because they're using tracers and being shot into, they're, they're hitting the front of the convoy. It turns out they were hitting the mine clearing, which is just a one person uh, gets in it, uh, driver, and he leads the convoy. They hit him and they moved on to the vehicle next to it, which returned fire and took him out. Unfortunately, we, we lost the guy who was driving that, 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 that thing. And for me, it was always, it's always been kind of traumatic because my avenue of fire, my security that I was, I was pulling was off to the left. And this happened good distance forward. I could have traversed my weapon, tried to, you know, aim, but I would have what's called flag, which basically I'd be putting rounds like going right near your shoulder, basically, which is completely unsafe. So obviously I didn't, but so I just had to sit here, cover my security this way, but the corner of my eye seeing these tracer rounds hitting and it was, it's always going to be one of the toughest, toughest moments of my military career. I still have trauma about driving through the fire. And then of course, feeling helpless with the guy, you know, getting killed that you can't do anything. So to me, it was both those. Of course, you had everything leading up to that. You know, you had all, you know, the rocket attack, you had the, the small arms fire, uh, the IEDs, everything leading up to that. To this day, those events still, still affect me because I mean, I'm still in therapy. Um, loud noises still get me uh, like everybody else. Uh, fire gets me. I don't. Um, a couple of times, my girlfriend wanted to turn on the, uh, her fireplace, and uh, I can do it sometimes. But then eventually, I start feeling the, the warm on my cheek. You know, the, the warmness on your skin and everything. And I just flashes back to that uh, to that fire because I was I was I was in it. It was a huge wall of fire, and I was in it. And I can, whenever I feel that warmth of heat from a fire on my cheek, I just automatically go back to that, and it's not a good place. For the most part, I walked away uh, from both those tours completely um, fine, minus uh, you know inner stuff and TBI. One of the IED attacks uh, that we that I sustained probably at that point was like probably four, or five, six, nine, where you basically just see dirt and sometimes a little bit of an explosion in front of it. Truck, whole truck gets rocked by an IED. So this happened a couple of times. I did receive the bronze, uh, my second tour in Iraq, um, but I didn't get it with. V for Valor or anything, so I didn't. Uh, I didn't actually feel like putting in paperwork. Basically, it's for the entire year in Iraq, for all the engagements that I had, for the entire year, for keeping my guys safe, because I focused on keeping them safe. Um, so I got the bronze for all my actions for that entire tour, 15 month tour 0709. I spent three Christmases in Iraq, and my second was really cool because. The unit, the, the MIT team, we made it cool. We decided to not do a mission that day, Christmas Day, but we did do Christmas Eve. And so coming back Christmas Eve, the guy that we leave behind on the radio, every unit has the Joker. He's like, be on the lookout in your area, sightings of a fat man on a sleigh with, we think, approximately 12 reindeer. I say again, approximately 12 reindeer. Uh, flying low in your area keep an eye out do not engage <laughs> the whole convoy starts laughing their butts off um, but it kind of started relaxing us because you know like I was saying before you know humor can sometimes break up the monotony uh, for me that was my second straight Christmas uh, there it's hard but that's how we get through it so we get back and we already had it fully planned out that we were going to do the, what's that white elephant I think it's called we had a team of like 20 people we had two mid teams put together and a couple of people's churches including my parents church sponsored us um, one of our majors his daughter's class sponsored us his daughter was a school teacher I think so we had all this stuff and we just sat around and we're in, we're like totally just out of uniform and I think we all got our little Christmas hats on I think I had one ones with the with the uh, elf ears which I still have 
Uh, we'll never throw that away. Um, and we're just going around exchanging gifts. And then we had all these snacks. We had a nice little buffet of all these snacks. And there was a chow hall across the way. And that night, none of us wanted to go to bed. Just for that one moment, it was good. We had a nice meal. We joked around. We were doing the white elf and making jokes, passing stuff around. It was, it was a great Christmas. And the next day, we put our gear back on. And we went back out the wire. And we went back to work. I got back from Iraq. Colorado and I uh, got ready to PCS again, permanent change station. So I had seven more years left and I switched over to counterintelligence. And I was in a place called Heidelberg, Germany. So I spent about a year and a half in, in, in Heidelberg. I was the NCUIC of the uh, military intelligence office. Then they closed the base down, very sad, gave it back to the Germans. So they moved me and the family just an hour down the road to a place called Kaiserslautern. I finished out uh, uh, the rest of my four years, uh, we ended up deciding to extend an extra year there. So instead of three, four years. Also while in Germany, I became a Sergeant First Class back on Heidelberg. While I was there, I got a, a six month deployment to Romania, uh, which I was also responsible for Bulgaria. I got to go there a couple times too, because it was my AO. Um, loved Romania. Uh, then I came back from Romania and uh, then uh, I found out that I was they needed me in Ukraine. Um, this thing with the Russians was kicking off pretty much. Crimea, actually, they invaded Crimea actually when I was in Romania. And now they decided that a year, about a year later that we need to send soldiers there, me and my team of uh, agents, um, two CIA agents, counterintelligence special agents, and an interpreter. So I ended up staying there six months uh, in a place called Lviv, which if you see the news now is completely devastated, destroyed. I have lots of souvenirs from Lviv. So anyways, uh, finished out that tour, um, moved my family to uh, uh, eventually Colorado. I went to Kuwait, ended up being there two years. And then after Kuwait, I um, got to go to Co Colorado for all of two months. I did that so I could finish up retirement. You can't retire out of a place like Kuwait. So I went there um, and I retired out of Colorado, uh, started what's called um, terminal leave in June, and I became a civilian September 1, 2018. It's just remarkable that everything in my life has led to me being here. I mean, if I hadn't gone to Iraq, I never would have met my ex-wife. And if I never would have met her, I wouldn't be in Tyler, Texas. And if I'm not in Tyler, Texas, I would not be working at Camp V. So it's just funny how things work. And I never would have been deployed to Iraq if 9-11 didn't happen. I might have gone to Iraq, I might have not. Definitely wouldn't have done a 12 and a 15 month tour. But so it's just, it's funny how things work out. Basically the main purpose of Camp V is to provide services and camaraderie ships for veterans. I'm in charge of the resource center. The resource center brings in all the different resources and services for the veterans. So when a veteran comes in and gets any services, that's me. Mm. David Austin Roses just dropped off 50 plants. They're not the best, they're dying a little bit, but I think a little bit of TLC, yeah. especially from a veteran, even a Marine. <laughs> um, Army would do better with it, I think, right? <laughs> Army would do better with a plant just this week. Somebody called because they needed help doing some home renovations. I called in every person I possibly knew, like 18 different people, and I'm finding different programs and everything. I'm in charge of our volunteer program. Camp V, we're, as you know, we're very young, very small, um, so we need a lot of volunteers. Anytime we do a project like the homeless stand down last week, I have to not only get the volunteers, I have to recruit them, train them, background check them, and get them plugged into different events that we need. Yvonne, you, you and myself will be right here. The organizations will come in. We'll check them in. They got it. Oh, everybody needs to sign in too. There's a there's a signing roster for volunteers. Where's the VA? VA. Uh, you're going to be all the way over here. I didn't know you guys were bringing such a big truck. Well, this is the first annual homeless veteran stand down uh, here at Camp V. We've done it in conjunction with the VA. We're very proud of it. We went uh, to the community and we went to the community and said, hey, we want to put this on for our homeless veterans. We want to help out the homeless veterans as best we can. And the outpour from the community has been absolutely outstanding. We have over 45 organizations here today helping us out with our, with our homeless veterans. 
So yeah, the veterans are gonna be taken care of today, not to mention from Camp B, they're gonna be getting a backpacks donated from Backpacks for Life that our, vet, that our volunteers helped pack just this past Wednesday uh, with donations we got from the entire community. It's not to mention sleeping bags and blankets. This is just, this is a great day for, for East Texas and for our veterans because the community has just really come out and did everything they could. We're also that camaraderie that every last one of our veterans misses from when we were in. Now, I could not have done any of this without the teamwork that was instilled in me in the military. And you look over my shoulder, everybody that's here, there's a good 40% of them are veterans. And that's probably why when I picked up the phone, they did not hesitate to be like, yep, we'll be there. What do you need? I do a lot. It's the busiest I've been since I left the military. Um, but uh, it is ridiculously rewarding. Rally Point Luncheon is a free luncheon we do for our veterans every um, Tuesday, noon to one, and we bring in different organizations and they sponsor it. And what's really cool about that is you're gonna see veterans ranging from 20 years old to almost 80 years old, if not even older than that. Um, mostly Korea vets, Vietnam vets, Gulf War vets, and they're just sitting around finding common ground, getting that camaraderie ship that, that they have missed. Because everybody I talk to, they've missed it. And I tell them the second they walk through those doors, whether you like it or not, that you're family now. You're family. I'm your uncle now. So shut up and go get some free food. Hang out with us. When you're in the military, you're never alone because you always have somebody. So when you get out, you don't have that. There's no military installation around here. Well, there is, and it's Camp V. I, I, did, I did 21 years, and of that 21 years, two and a half was spent in a combat zone. Okay, whoop de frickin' did. But I did more than just that. I mean, yeah, I'm proud of my time in Iraq, but I'm also very proud of what I did in Romania. I'm also proud of what I did in Ukraine, the Pentagon, and stuff like that. I'm proud of a lot of stuff I did. It's not just about Iraq. And unfortunately nowadays, that's all people see. They just, they just see that. I mean, yes, I served, but and I served in Iraq, but it's, it's not all about that. It, we can be proud. We can talk about other things that aren't just that. It just, it does seem like civilians just want us to talk about Iraq. They just want to know about Iraq. Well, I did other cool stuff too, you know? I was a dog handler. I did security from uh, Clinton to Bush um, I, I wasn't around for Barack, but I actually did security for uh, Bush Sr. when he was at the uh, Olympics. He was the ambassador at the 04 Olympics. So I'm, I'm very proud of all that. Just Iraq isn't what defines me. My entire career, everything I did, I'm very proud of serving my country for 21 years. But I'm just not some guy who served two tours on Iraq. I'm a guy who did a lot more. What, what do I see in my future? What's my future? Um, what, what am I doing now after the military? Well, simple, this. This is my daughter, Aubrey. She turned uh, 10 last month. I missed four of the, her six years, and now I've been with her nonstop. So this is everything I do. This is my future, this is her.